Well, hi, everybody. Okay, got it, recording. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Financial Insights Wealth Management's Wisdom with Women series. I am thrilled to introduce our speaker. Well, first, I'm Amanda Burroughs. I'm a wealth advisor and certified financial planner here at Financial Insights. And I am thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Annie Arbenz, a local in the area. And I'll tell you a little bit about her. She grew up in Seattle and obtained her business degree from the University of Washington. From there, she went straight to Gonzaga University School of Law with the goal of becoming an estate planning attorney. Her first real job out of law school was in Tacoma, and she quickly fell in love with the South Sound and has owned and operated a successful estate planning practice in Old Town, Tacoma for over 10 years. Her firm recently opened a second location in Gig Harbor as well. Annie and her husband, Casey, have two children, ages seven and eight, back to back. Way to go, Annie. Um, <laughs> they're an adventurous bunch and can be found at various Ironman competitions around the world, on soccer fields around the region, or relaxing in Chelan, their favorite place. Annie loves collecting high heels, is currently learning Italian, and loves working out so she can eat whatever she wants. If you want to learn more about estate planning, you can check out her podcast, which actually I did this morning and it was wonderful. Uh, the podcast is called You Can't Take It With You. It's available on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So that's Annie. With that, take it away. Thanks, Amanda. First of all, you pronounced Gonzaga correctly, which is always a win. You, must, <laughs> you have a connection, obviously. But hey, that, yeah. that, that just okay. sounds like... a uh, a, a lot about me. So yeah, you guys basically know it all. Um, I think it is relevant though, because I have little kids and we're busy and I know that everyone here is busy. So kudos to everyone for being here today. I am always impressed when my clients come in to talk about death and incapacity and how to plan for it, because it's not everyone's favorite topic. Um, that's the least you can say about it, but I, um, I, I am always impressed and I'm even more impressed that y'all are here on a sunny Wednesday afternoon. So just a testament to how effective financial insights team is at making sure people get the information that, um, yeah, that you want. So uh, first of all, I know a lot of you are hidden from camera, which I am always doing myself if I'm not talking, but, um, for those of you who are on camera, can you just give me like a, a raise your hand if you like physically raise your hand, I guess you can raise it in zoom as well. But if I can see if you already have an estate plan or a will or something in place, just to get an idea. All right. Oh, and you're zipping. Oh, this is so interactive fun. Okay. Okay. So I get kind of a blend of folks here just kind of helps me understand where we're at and, um, the depth of knowledge that we're gonna get into here. It's called Estate Planning 101 that's self-titled. It is some basic stuff and we kind of go into the deep end on a few things. So I just wanna kind of get an idea of where we're at. So everyone will learn something, I promise. And Katie and I were talking, Amanda and I were talking earlier about um, questions. If you have them, ask them or raise your hand. Katie is gonna help moderate, make sure that I can, I probably won't see them, but she will. So I'm happy to be interrupted. And so if you need my attention, you can get it somehow, or you can type a question to Katie and she can make sure to ask it. Sound good? All right. So I, you know, in true lawyer fashion, I do have a PowerPoint for you guys to look at because I do find it's helpful to follow along when you got things to, to present. So here I am. Can you all, all see my screen share there? Fantastic. Enough nods to go forward. Um, so like, Amanda says, I'm Annie. Um, I've been a lawyer for 15 years here in Tacoma, and I did go to law school to be an estate planning lawyer, which people think is weird, but I absolutely love it. Um, my favorite thing to do is talk. Um, and if you ever <laughs> do sit down with me, and you'll notice today, I, I can gab with the best of them. And I love hearing about people's lives, where they end up, how they got where they are, about their families. And so this job really allows me to hear about other people, learn about their stories, and help them at the same time in planning and getting organized. And my, my law firm in Tacoma, excuse me, is located right in Old Town. So I'm in the corner of McCarver and, um, and 30th right now. So if there's a train noise, you know where it's coming from. 
Um, but that's where I am at this moment. But we also have the office in Gig Harbor downtown. So I'm, I split my time between both at this point. You guys, I'll admit, last night I looked, I, I Googled estate planning comics because I needed a little levity, I felt. And <laughs> this one came up, but it made me, it made me laugh. Um, and I always call estate planning adulting because it, it is, it really is something that you do as an adult because we don't get a lot of 18 year olds in here. I would love to see more 18 year olds, but we don't get them very often. I, I love this. The guy in the bed says, hey, Wanda, we need to think about updating our wills. Wanda says, you're probably right. They think about it. He says, there, we thought about it. That's a start. And she says, being a grown up stinks. And I, I tend to agree with that in a lot of ways. But one thing I do know about estate planning, and I see it in every single face as I say goodbye to my clients once they've signed their documents, is it does bring an incredible, like so much peace of mind and having this off your plate. So you don't have to sit in bed thinking about it anymore or wake up or as you're about to take off in the airplane, this is not what's on your mind. And that is the goal and the estate planning process. So here we go. There are two people that I credit with being here in front of you today. And there's a lot of people that have helped me out along the way, but two people that kind of got me to where I am in terms of why I do estate planning. The first one is this lady, she's Ramona. This is my Nana. She died in 2006 at the age of 86, and um, she had a great life. Nana was a bit of a diva and loved performance and singing and acting and all these beautiful things, and she was amazing, a huge inspiration to me. It won't be a surprise maybe to you to hear that Nana had an amazing binder when she died, and it was full of the plans for her memorial, which included a seating chart. A, um, a program for what songs would be sung, the, the versions of the songs that would be sung by whom, and also what we would say at her memorial and what her obit would say. I mean, it was extensive, right? What Nana didn't have is a will. So she had this beautiful memorial plan, no will, a bunch of kids and grandkids that got along. But unfortunately, my dad and his brothers and sister were ended up navigating a very messy probate in Michigan where none of them lived and, you know, paying lawyers to figure it out. And fortunately, like I say, everyone got along, but it took forever and it was very expensive. And she ended up paying taxes that were, as I now know, unnecessary. So um, watching that administration after my Nana died was a big deal. And I just wanted to say, hey, Nana, could you have signed a will? to help us all out with this because it would have helped a lot in my family. Um, so Nana's one. And here is my dad. His name is Scott. My dad died about five years ago from pancreatic cancer. Um, I'm just looking at him. I, I get to talk about my dad a lot because um, well, I try to, I like to keep his memory alive, but he had about a two and a half year battle with pancreatic cancer, which is a long time. It was a long, long two and a half years, but um also a man, just like his mama, did not want to do estate planning, okay? So his daughter is an estate planning lawyer. He had pancreatic cancer, right? This isn't going well. And he did not want to get, oh, thank you, Molly. Molly says, so sorry. Um, so he did not want to get a will that he didn't want to talk about it. And me being the pragmatic lawyer was saying to him, dad, you have to talk about this stuff, right? Because I'm going to be dealing with it. And I don't want to have to you know, fill in the gaps when I, I would like to do what you want us to do. So he got a couple things done literal days before he died. It was fairly traumatic, but we did it. He got it done. Um, but except for one thing, he had very strong intentions with his life insurance, one of his life insurance policies, but he hadn't updated the, de the, the designation on that. So it was an outdated beneficiary designation. It was to be distributed in a way that he did not intend which created what I call awkward tension in my family. And that is now one of my goals in life is to help other families avoid awkward tension. The end of that story is it all ended up fine, but it was annoying. It was a ton of paperwork. We had to have those awkward conversations and ultimately the right thing happened, but it could have been done better. So Nana, dad, I'm sure we'll have more stories as life goes on, but these are the people that have affected or has, have influenced me to come here. And this is really, these are really the people who 
I think about every day when I help my clients, because we all have these stories, right? Whether um, it's always a precipitating factor that people come in to get their planning done. It's, um, you know, my, my aunt's estate was a mess. My so-and-so had a living trust. And I thought that was really cool. I want to make sure that this happens with my body after I die. People have different reasons for coming, but I think it all comes back down to you care about your family and I am here for that. And that is my favorite thing is to take care of your family after you're gone so that we can get all this stuff done as easily as possible. Um, so I've got a lot of nitpicky stuff for you guys to go through, but I, I do want to tell you a couple things. I don't know. You guys might not know this about lawyers or maybe you do. I don't know. But um, lawyers love horror stories. We love talking about all the bad stuff we've had to deal with. It kind of makes us feel like we're relevant and important and necessary. So I do, I have a couple great ones and I am going to share some of these with you, you guys, because you've heard a couple from my family. I wouldn't call them horror stories, but they're kind of what, you know, how I got here, but I was going to rattle off a few. And I, I don't know if you have your own, I would love to hear them at another time or in the chat, if you're wanting to share, but um, some that come off the top of my mind, truly within 30 seconds, I can think of all these in the 15 years I've been practicing. Um, I, I once had a, a probate where they, the family spent $10,000 in attorney's fees fighting about a duck call lanyard. Do you know what a duck call is? I do because my husband's a duck hunter, but I didn't before. Um, I learned a lot about them in this process. And it wasn't just me making the tacky, but it wasn't just me. There were other lawyers involved fighting about this duck call lanyard. It's about how you, when you hunt, you, you, blow through a thing to make a duck noise so that the ducks come flocking to you. This a person died with a whole lanyard of them. It was probably worth $150, but the family was so mad at each other and so attached to this duck call lanyard that we had to fight about it. And believe me, we tried not to, but it was just, it wasn't even about the duck call lanyard at the end of it. But that's, that was the output was who got the $150 duck call lanyard. They ended up just paying each other. It was it was a mess. And it was not how I like to practice law. Um, I had once, same case, actually. An 11-year-old um, was in the position to argue with her stepmom about where her dad's ashes were to go. That's a nasty situation and one I want to help people avoid. Um, I've seen, here we go. I can go to my next slide here. Um, I've seen, I, I call them sister probates, just siblings fighting about stuff that, you know, goes deep. And it tends to be my, my, my sisters, the boys don't get too attached to stuff as do girls. So I kind of, I kind of think of them as sister probates, but uh, that would be the duck call lanyard as an example. I've seen deathbed marriages. I've seen people literally dying and getting married to someone. And then that person inherits their whole estate that ended up in litigation for five years. I've seen a power of attorney lose, lose $500,000 and not be able to account for it. We later learned out it went to drugs, but what happened is the, and you know, that person couldn't pay it back after they were convicted and put in jail, but the estate heirs did not get that money back either. Um, I call them casserole ladies and pool boys. That's when um, your spouse has died. And then they, the casserole ladies come around offering food and they're, you know, they're happy to help out and quick marriage, get money and um, all of a sudden divert the estate plan away from your children after you've died. So these things happen all the time. Estranged family members get an estate because there's no will. Um, life insurance, if a designation lists an ex-spouse, it can still go to the ex-spouse. So a lot of legal traps in this world. And um, my goal again is to help avoid those from happening. So here, some of the nitpicky legal stuff. Um, if you don't have a will in Washington state, half of you do, half of you don't. So those of you who don't have a will right now, if you died, um, there is a flurry of laws that work together to create a plan for your estate. And you know, this is what the legislature over years have said, most people like this plan. So we're gonna go with this. And it's a classic, it goes to your spouse. If your spouse isn't around, then it goes to your kids. Or if you don't have a spouse, it goes to your kids. If you don't have kids, it goes to your parents. Then it goes to your siblings, then to your nieces and nephews. There's this whole thing. Yes, it can end up with the state of Washington, but that's only if all those other people aren't around. Okay, so people worry about that. Take, take a lot to get to that. And I actually haven't seen it yet, but it is something that could happen. If you don't have a will, you your estate will go through probate. How many of you, quick show of hands, have 
have been, have dealt with probate before. Yeah, it's um, sometimes, I, I don't think anyone would call it a, a cakewalk. I think someone, some people might say it wasn't as bad as I thought, which is great, but um, it is to, to understand it in its simplest terms, probate is the way, it's a court process to get assets out of a dead person's name and into the beneficiary's names. And the issue is the court needs to appoint an executor or a legal representative to get those things into the beneficiary's name. So really it's a question of who has authority. Okay, person, go get all the stuff done. And then basically let us know when you're done with it. So it's about transferring authority to another person. Um, so probate is required in most cases, um, typically if you have real estate or if you have over $100,000 in your estate. Again, state law butts in and says, this is who's gonna be your executor. This is where your estate is gonna go. And we might put a little, a few safeguards on the, on the administration of your estate to make sure that everyone gets what they're entitled to. So those are in the form of like an insurance policy. They make the executor get an insurance policy to make sure they do the job the right way. They could require the executor to come back every time they wanna do something and get court permission. Um, and ultimately the court kind of directs where the estate goes. Now, the reason people think probate is a mess or a nightmare is, well, there are three, one is TV, right? It, it creates good drama on TV too, is because there's no will. Probate without a will is complicated. It's, it takes time longer and it's more expensive. The, and the third reason is the people in your family don't get along and it's out on display in the court process, if that's the case. So I, I like to say, usually it's the people that create a bad probate, not the court, okay? But they all kind of add up to say the same thing. The other um, downside, if you don't have a will and you do have minor children, this is a big issue. The court will, go, will instigate what's called a guardianship proceeding to determine who should be guardian of your children their legal representative until they're 18 years old. You have no say in that, right? It takes a long time, could take a long time, usually does. And it is very expensive for the estate. The only way you can appoint a guardian for your minor kiddos is to do it in a will. It's very important. So I say, if you have, have, if you have a kiddo, get a will. At, it is minimal to get the guardian designation. There's a lot of complications and this could, this could and is um, an entire separate hour about what is your estate, what comprises your estate. Um, it, it, basically from a tax perspective, it's everything you can control, but where the issues come in is how do you define your state with your spouse or with a significant other that you're not married to? And so we have issues about community versus separate property. And I'll dig into that a little bit more, but it's always a question of what how do we characterize property? And that also plays into how it's distributed. So that's all governed by state law, unless you say otherwise. Um, I talked about the cost and time. Probate is just, um, it takes at least four months usually. It can, I shoot, I've had probates open for almost my entire career. So it just depends on the case and the people involved, um, but it is a lot more complicated without a will. Okay, so if we now look how, happy these ladies are with this little cute little baby because if you have a will things are much cheerier after someone dies if that I, that came out weird but um it is easier to deal with an estate when you have a will common misconception is that you that having a will skips probate not true it has nothing to do with that um, there are other ways to skip probate if you need to, but a will makes probate a lot easier. So people are often disappointed when I say, oh, we still have to go through probate because there was real estate or because there was over a hundred thousand dollars. And uh, they say, well, I have a will, or, you know, my dad had a will. And I said, At least that tells us what to do and it will help a lot. And I'll probably save you $5,000 or more but it doesn't help us skip probate entirely, which I don't think is a bad thing in most cases. Probate creates structure. It helps us get it done efficiently and it makes sure that it's done the right way. With the will, of course, you're in control. You say who the executor will be. This is a person you need to trust that will get it done the right way, won't scam anyone, won't lose $500,000.
Um, you can waive the requirement for bond or that insurance policy I talked about before. You can significantly decrease court involvement to basically not zero, but a but very close to zero. Um, you can appoint the guardian for your kids. I think that's so important. I have two little kids, like Amanda said, and uh, man, I don't know if people would be fighting over them, but it would be nice of me to say what I want to happen so that there's not that awkward tension about how to do it, plus the court costs and the attorney's fees to deal with it. And of course, you can control how your estate is distributed. A lot of people say, hey, I, you know, I'll go to my spouse, my spouse dies, then it goes to my kids in equal shares. And that is what will happen under state law. But there are things that may change your mind about whether you want to do it that way um, or how you want to distribute it to your kids. And we will talk about that a little bit. I think um, it's, it's safe to say that it is about half the cost to go through probate if you have a will than if you don't. So um, that I, I, I like well, shoot, I'm a probate lawyer, so I, I kind of like probate, but I think it does create a lot of good structure, like I said, and um, it can be done very efficiently. And that is a huge goal in our practice is to get it done as efficiently as possible. Okay, so this will probably um, catch your attention because it's not a horrible visual, um, just like money going to someone else's hand looks like the government. So um, a, a lot of people hire our firm to help them avoid or mitigate the estate tax. Um, you can call it the death tax, you can call it whatever you want it, but the state gets a piece of your estate in certain situations. And as a Washington resident, we have two estate taxes to worry about. Yep, that's more than most states. Um, but in every state, there is a federal estate tax, which means that if you die with an, with an estate that's worth over a certain amount of money called the exemption, then the amount in excess of the exemption will be taxed at a rate of 40% at the federal level. Right now, the federal estate tax exemption is super high. It's that middle, but middle bullet, 12, almost $13 million. And that is, just so you know, doubled for a married couple. So you can, a married couple can give away 26 million almost. Um, there should be some thought put into that before it's done for various reasons, but the idea is that when you when you when you both die, you can get your estate can give up to that amount without paying any tax. If it's over, then it's a pretty hefty tax. Okay, but that that those are large numbers, and that is set. Katie, yeah, we have a question. Yeah, um, from Alexandra it says, does that include money in retirement accounts? Yes. Short answer. Sadly, yes. Also, um, you should all know that it includes the death benefits on a life insurance policy. So if you're like me and you have insurance for all kinds of stuff, including a lot for life, um, it helps me sleep at night. But I know that that entire death benefit that would go to my family when I die is taxable at the estate tax level. So retirement and life insurance and everything else, equity in your home. I think in this case, it's if you're ever wondering if something's included, I would default to yes. There are ways to make it so that's not the case for certain assets. And that's pretty involved estate and gift tax planning, which we can help you with. Financial Insights is awesome at that too, in terms of how to structure your estate to mitigate the estate tax. But think about it like this. If you control an asset, it will be included in your estate. I control the beneficiary designation of my life insurance it's included in my estate. Okay. Good question. Everyone asked that. And it's sadly, the answer is yes. Um, so we got the federal estate tax that applies to every state in the country, no matter where you live or reside. Um, but here in Washington, we have a cute little estate tax with a very low exemption of 2.193 million. So I'm going to call it 2.2 helps me talk about it. So if you die with over $2.2 .2 million in your estate, the excess, again, same concept, the excess will be taxed at a lower rate than the federal government, but the state will tax it at 10 to 20%, depending on how far over that exemption you are. And here's the kicker. It's not doubled for a married couple. So an, a takeaway from this is when the, if you're married, when the first one of you dies and you give every, and assuming you give everything to your spouse, 
there is no tax on that transfer. So the, there would not be a tax on the first death. But when the second one of you has died, if that amount is over 2.193 million, the excess will be taxed. And I'm not trying to sell anything here, but an estate planning attorney can help you double that exemption and work on ideas for how to make sure your estate is closer to the 2.2 so there's less of an excess or how to plan so that you get the double exemption in a married couple after you've died. But unlike the federal estate tax, we don't automatically double it. So it is worth looking at all you control and seeing if that's an issue. I usually start talking about it when a married couple has about 1.5 million, okay? Life insurance, equity, retirement accounts, everything included. I'm gonna touch on the gift tax. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but it is worth knowing that there is a gift tax. It works in tandem with the federal estate tax, but it is separate from the Washington estate tax. So there's some really, this is a legal term, there's some really cool planning that we can do with the fact that this gift tax is federal and not state. And we can kind of work with that in our planning. And you know, the team at Financial Insights gets this. There's, it's a pleasure to work with them because they know what I'm talking about when I say, hey, can we do some gifting to help? So I want to tell you this though, the, the federal gift tax says generally that you pay a tax when you make a gift. That's the general rule. The big exclusion here is if you, you can give up to $17,000 in 2023, that number changes, it goes up for inflation, bless the federal government, but you can give $17,000 a year right now without even telling, without paying the gift tax for one, but you don't even have to tell the IRS about it. They don't even care, nor does the person receiving the gift. So that's what you hear about that annual exclusion. It's $17,000 and you can give it to everyone, right? I can give it to both of my kids. Well, they, no, they're minors. So I wouldn't want to do that, but I could give it to everyone on this Zoom and I wouldn't have to tell the federal government about it. So could my husband for that matter. We could each give everyone on this Zoom $17,000 without even telling the feds. So there's some really effective tax planning you can do there and it works with the estate tax. So just, just kind of a radar issue more than anything else. Any questions about estate tax? Because usually this is a little bit of a doozy, but I'm always available if you have more <laughs> questions afterwards. Sometimes you just got to process. All righty. All right, we talked about probate, we talked about wills, but there's all this other stuff that we hear about, right? Beneficiary designations. Oh, hey, Jeff, I see a hand. I don't uh, know. Yes. Um, I had a quick question. I'm actually Denise. Um, what would the benefit be then of having your assets in, say, a family trust? Are they still subject to these similar taxes? <gasps> what an amazing segue, Denise. I, I, so there are all kinds of trusts. Um, the main one that people talk about is a living trust. Um, and a living trust is, is, I'll get into a little more detail about it, but it is, it is merely a vehicle to hold your assets to, for administrative purposes. So the short answer there is that putting it into a living trust does not help avoid the estate tax. There is no tax benefit to doing that, but there are lots of other types of trusts that we can utilize. Usually they're irrevocable, meaning you can't change them. So it's kind of like sheltering your money in a tax, in a trust for estate tax purposes. And that is kind of a whole, that's like estate planning 400, right? But it is very interesting um, to look at your estate with a estate planning attorney and maybe your, the folks at, at Financial Insights to see what are options for you there because you can do a lot. Depends on a lot of factors. But it's okay. not your typical living trust. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. Good question. So, but it is a great segue because living trusts are this thing. They are these things that everyone asks about and wants to know about. Um, and, and they're kind of, I kind of lump them together here with beneficiary designations and all this other stuff that we hear about, right? Like joint tenants and, oh my gosh, but I'm on this account with my mom. What does that mean? So there are certain assets that avoid probate, right? And, and this is where a team, your financial, legal, and tax team, if you have a CPA, an advisor, and a, an attorney, really nice for us all to work together. So we're all speaking the same language because I, I have my goals from a legal perspective, financial advisors have their goals. Um, I didn't like it because. Oh, hey Dorothy. 
Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so they have, everyone has their own things that they're looking at, right? So I really like working with having a team approach to this stuff, but things that avoid probate, meaning assets that wouldn't have to go through a court process and would not be subject to your will are these ones listed here. So a joint tenancy that's with rights of survivorship. That's like a bank account that has two people on it. It usually defaults to the, the surviving owner if one person has died. Payable on death or transfer on death accounts. Um, I realize there are so many stupid acronyms that we use, but man, I really lean on them. So I use them a lot here, but this is the same concept here as when uh, an owner of a financial account, usually, usually at a bank, when, an, uh, when one of the owners has died, if they designate a payable on death beneficiary or a transfer on death beneficiary, that goes directly to that person upon death. It wouldn't go through the will or probate or any of that. Transfer on death deed is relatively new. I say that, but it's, still, it's like nine years old, but gosh, this stuff moves like molasses in the state law. So uh, the transfer on death deed is by putting a beneficiary on your house. It's a deed that you sign real time, record it with the county, and it just sits there. It doesn't actually transfer ownership real time, but when you've died, it's effectively like having a beneficiary designation on a financial account. So really nifty. I think they're overused. I think there are very specific situations where this works well and a lot of situations where it works really badly. For example, I don't think that any siblings should co-own real estate out of the gate. If they want to, that's for them to figure out, but I generally don't think that's a good starting point for siblings. I've, I've been hired in a lot of situations to help people untangle um, awkward tension about real estate ownership with their siblings. So I don't love it out of the gate, but I, I'll, I can be convinced if you want to try to convince me. Um, Life insurance and annuities, those are great assets to put beneficiary designations on for various reasons. Um, they go directly to the people. It usually happens quite quickly. And with life insurance in particular, we call it the, a super asset because if you list a beneficiary, the estate, uh, excuse me, the, the, bene the, the proceeds from the life insurance policy are not subject to the debts of the decedent. So you don't have to use those to pay off bills um, and it's, it's kind of protected. So those are really great assets to have and important to put beneficiaries on, but in the right way. And of course, retirement accounts coming back to those guys. Usually those are huge IRAs. There's a lot of tax issues and in income tax considerations with IRAs, especially while you're alive that continues after you have died. As um, I'm sure many of you have heard about, we've got this relatively new law, the SECURE Act, that um, now controls how long money can be held in an IRA after someone has died or when you roll it over. Um, there are exceptions to this rule, but generally speaking, you have 10 years to use up the money in the IRA or have it distributed out, which means you're paying the income tax in a shorter amount of time instead of for the remainder of your lifetime as a beneficiary, which used to be the case. So those of us in the planning world don't love the SECURE Act, but it is one that we are working around these days. Um, the reason for doing that is, is to help Americans plan their retirement. So uh, let's see, we've got a chat here. Does the basis reset upon inheriting it? Generally, okay, Alexander, good question. Um, basis is the idea, well, it's the, the value of an asset um, for tax reasons. And we do generally, as of right now, <laughs> um, when you die, all of your assets get what's called a step up in basis. So yes, is the general answer to that question, which means my example, my best example is let's say you buy a house for $100,000 20 years ago, you die, it's worth $500,000. And then your kids turn around and sell it out of your estate. Instead of paying, and they sell, let's say they sell it for 550. Okay. So if you go from, if, the basis would be 500. And so any gain would be on the 50,000 for the, for the sale price. That's a huge benefit because it's not the hundred thousand dollar basis. So the capital gain is a lot less because of the step up in basis. So yes, Alexander, the answer is everything gets a step up still right now. That's a political issue though. Ben question does a Roth account avoid taxes after 
transfer. Um, okay, so there, there's a lot of complicated rules with Roths, but there generally it can, the, the idea is that it gets extended so that you don't have to pay it, but it, there's nothing that says they're just completely avoided, right? So it's as they're paid out. Um, and I would probably look to my financial folks to better address that question. Amanda, do you have a quick answer to Ben's question? Can you see it? A Roth? Let me figure out how to unmute here. Here you are. Okay, so, so our Roth account, does a Roth account avoid taxes after transfer? Generally, yes. If you follow the rules of a Roth, which is you have to have it for five years. So you have to meet the five-year rule. Once you have that and you're over 59 and a half, it's a completely tax-free account. And after your death, your beneficiaries can inherit your Roth completely tax-free. Um, but as far as whether or not they keep it inside of a Roth, you still have, because of Secure 2.0, we've got that 10-year rule. So your beneficiaries can have a beneficiary Roth IRA, but they have to distribute that money out within 10 years. Complicated, but yes. And come talk to us about your specific Roth situation. <laughs> So it is. It's a it's a loaded question, but this is perfect example. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. It's a perfect example mm -hmm. because I'm constantly we're going back and forth, and even this morning, Amanda and I were emailing back and forth on kind of a tricky tax issue, and it's just really nice to have both brains. But uh, yeah, specific. You got to look at the Roth specifically. So I would take it into Amanda after looking at it. Uh, but hey, Ben, good question. Uh, let's see. We've got we talked about it time. Okay. Again, I think that we could do a full day, y'all. If you want to do a full day of talking about um, retirement accounts and estate planning, I I could be up for that, maybe. <laughs> that band is like, no. <laughs> um, okay, so back to this concept of a living trust. This is one of the, the documents that do avoid probate. So we're talking administrative stuff here, right? Away from taxes, more administrative. A revocable living trust is... is um, well, here's a little visual, in fact. I forgot that I put this here. Um, it's the idea of putting all of your assets into a trust that you control, okay? You are in control of the living trust. It owns everything that you used to own, jewelry, your, your accounts, your house, real estate's really big. In my mind, you really want a living trust to own real estate and financial accounts and or somehow be connected to financial accounts, whether that's through beneficiary designation or otherwise. The reason we do this if everything's already in a living trust, we don't need an outside party being the court. We don't need the court to tell us who's in charge of it because in your living trust, it's already owned by the trust and it's going to be controlled by the person you designate as trustee. So there's no court process required, which is a huge benefit in some, in some cases. I wouldn't say all cases. I, we are not a state where avoiding probate at all costs is important or necessary. There are other states where I do believe that is the case. Um, I'm not licensed in those states, but off the top and what I've had to deal with, it would um, be California, Florida, Arkansas. Uh, I had to deal with that recently, it was a mess. These are states where the probate process is very complicated and very expensive. So everyone in those states does a living trust to avoid those, those expensive, complicated procedures. A lot of people here have living trusts um, for various reasons, but I don't think they're the default here. I don't believe they are. Um, the reason I would say you want to get a living trust is one, it does, maybe you had a family member who had one, and it was wonderful. Um, but the big one is if you have real estate in a different state, that means you're going to be going through probate in various states. And if that's the case, I'd prefer you just put it all in a living trust and we don't have probate anywhere. But a lot of people hear about it. You know, um, like Susie Orman and Dave Ramsey, all these people talk about them like they're the best. And that's because they live in states where they are the best. So um, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty on living trusts. I probably, most of my, of my clients, we probably do about 30 to 40% living trust. It is going up because people do want them more. Um, and I think that the, out, like the world is getting more familiar with living trusts. So it used to be that if you had a living trust, and you wanted to refinance property that was in the living trust, you'd have to take it out via quit claim deed, refinance it in your names, 
and then put it back into the living trust, which now it's over $200 to record a deed in Washington state. So it's just not a very cost-effective option, but um, they're no long banks and lenders are really not requiring that as much anymore. So I think as we become more familiar, um, people are doing or accepting them more, which is nice. Um, an easy one to avoid probate is a community property agreement. This does not work in all situations. It works in a lot. And I talked about my dad before. This was the one thing I got him to sign to help out my stepmom, which was great because what it says is married couple, you, can, you have to be married to use this document. You both agree that when the first one of you dies, everything goes to the survivor. And that's in writing. We record it with the county auditor after the first one of you has died. We skip probate because you are legally entitled to everything in the estate and there's no need for court process or any of that. So we skip over it with the community property agreement. Wonderful tool in the right situations. Doesn't work great with a blended family in my experience, nor in an estate where there's an estate tax issue. So I think it's worth considering, but not going online and filling one out right now. Does that make sense? Okay, some other ancillary documents to your, you know, that kind of comprise the whole estate plan um, would be, I, the way I see this is you're doing the, the meaty stuff with the will and the living trust and all this. Why don't you also get this stuff done? It's equally as important in a lot of cases. Um, so this is where we kind of dig into incapacity planning and what happens when you are no longer able to make decisions for yourself. This could be because you're out of town and you're not able right away. It usually means you have dementia, you are unable to, you know, actually make decisions related to your affairs. So you have someone step in for you. This is an incredible amount of trust that you're putting in other person. And frankly, I've had a lot more issues with powers of attorney lately because banks, third parties, title companies, they don't love them, right? Uh, they don't trust them. They've been burned by them. So what this says is you, you are giving authority to someone else in writing to make decisions for you. And this can either be active or excuse me, active right now. Yeah. So effective right away or springing at a point in the future where you become incapacitated. So like I have one with my husband, it says my husband can make thing, make decisions for me right away. If he has to head to the bank or if he's buying a car and he needs to sign for me, it's not that easy, but he could legally do it because my power of attorney says that he can do it effective immediately. Springing would be I'm only wanting my husband to do this if I am incapacitated and a doctor has said, Annie can no longer make your decisions. So in that case, he could make decisions for me, but he'd first have to get the doctor's um, certification that I'm incapacitated, okay? Um, usually we get big broad powers here unless we don't know who the person, you know, we, we don't fully trust the person acting. And in which case I'd say, let's not put that person in the role. Um, it is fully unsupervised, right? No one's looking out for you. You're incapacitated. This person's doing your thing. So I gave you that horror story about the um, niece who was, who was the power of attorney for her uncle and he had no children. So she was his person. Um, and she misused the funds to the tune of $500,000 while he was alive And it. Um, took a long time and a lot of money to figure it all out, but ultimately she did end up going to prison. So these are big, important roles. And, um, it was, that was just a horrible story, but I, I see things like that all the time. Not, not like that all the time, but just like mistreatment of power. Um, but the reason you want a power of attorney is because the alternative is if you become incapacitated, you're off to the courts to get a guardianship because your kids, they, they can't act for you. Your friends can't act for you. We need a legal representative. And the only way to do that is through a guardianship. And I don't know, have you guys seen this movie? I care a lot. I talk about it a lot. <laughs> it's actually a really horrifying movie on Netflix about this woman who is a professional guardian. And these are all of her, you know, you can call them victims in the background, but it's, um, I don't think it's based on a true story, but it just goes to show you how susceptible we all are, especially when we become incapacitated as we age. So really important document to get in place. I will make a note here. If you're not married, but in a long-term relationship, your significant other does not have any legal authority to make decisions for you. So a power of attorney is especially important in that situation. So please make sure you get one in line. This is for financial and healthcare decisions. You can do them separately if you want one person making financial decisions and a different person making healthcare decisions, but put some thought into it and make sure that you have it in place just in case. Let's hope it's insurance and you never need it, but if we need it, it's good to have. 
another ancillary document that I like to see. And this, gosh, we are just having some fun here today. But this is the healthcare directive, um, also known as um, an advanced directive. And this is this pretty lady is Terry Shavo. Any of you recognize that name? Yes, nuts. Poor Terry. Um, she was, she, I think, related to a bulimia several years ago, maybe 20 plus years ago. She became, she was in a permanent unconscious condition. I guess we can call it a vegetative state where she had no, really no brain function. And she was being kept alive um, artificially. Very sad case. Her husband wanted to let her go. Her parents didn't want to see her die. Um, but no one knew what Terry wanted because she did not have anything in place. This, she was young. There was no reason for her to think that this would be the case, but no one knew what Terry wanted. So she, um, her family members ended up fighting, going up to the Supreme Court, back down, back up to the Supreme Court for years, hundreds of thousands in attorney's fees. Ultimately, Terry was um, taken off life support. After Terry Shavo died, there was a huge push on healthcare directives because everyone was worried that we, you know, you don't want to be like Terry Shavo. So this is a document where you say, if I'm in a permanent unconscious condition or I'm in a vegetative state, as determined by doctors, right? This is not, oh, the kids think I'm done. You are not, you are not there. You know, you're not, you're, you don't have, a, uh, you can't make decisions at this point. So when we're at this very horrible point, the doctors say, do we have a healthcare directive? And there is where you say whether you do or do not want life-sustaining treatment, which is typically water and food. If you say no to those things, your kids will allow, they will let you go. You will be um, allowed to die, I suppose, if that's your fancy, or you can say yes, and they will keep you alive and see how, you know, maybe they can work on things. This is, there's some gray area here, of course. We don't know all the answers. What I, this, this document is not a doctor's favorite. I, I, maybe there's some medical professionals in the group here, but my experience is medical professionals don't love this one. I think kids do because it allowed, I, I think it's like guilt mitigation, right? If your parent is in this situation, it's nice to know that you can let them go um, with their blessing, I guess. So it's nice to get in writing for your children. This is not a DNR, okay? Lawyers can't advise you on that. A DNR is a do not resuscitate order. That's where you would not be resuscitated if you um, lost consciousness or your heart stopped. I mean, this is not related to that. This is so far past that. Um, a DNR is something you can only sign with a medical, prof a, a doctor. So your a physician has to watch you sign it and witness it. Um, you don't have to be old to do this document. I say just everyone should have it. As I was getting rolled in to have my babies at St. Joe's, um, both times they asked me if I had a healthcare directive. I'm like, yes. Um, why? I, I have a plan to leave tomorrow with the baby. So um, it comes up in weird spots, but I would always recommend getting it just in case um, you need it. You're not unlike like Terry. Oh gosh, have anyone, has anyone seen Weekend of Bernie's? Do we remember this movie? This is, this is such a tacky picture, um, but it does get the point across. If you guys see Weekend of Bernie's, this Bernie in the middle is, is dead and these guys take him around for a whole weekend to pretend that he's alive. It's just so weird, but I always think about it because this is not how I would want to, my, my body to be handled after I die. So what we can do in the estate planning context is, is create what's called a disposition authorization. So you can tell your family what you'd prefer to happen. So we avoid the, the Bernie situation. Um, there are three options in Washington now. The first is burial. That's the traditional casket in the ground. Um, people tend to be leaning away from that these days and more towards cremation, which is the second option and um, a more affordable option, I suppose, if you're into that. And then a third option, which was made available in May of 2020 is so relatively new, is this concept of composting. So now your body can be composted and this beautiful little atrium is a um, up in Seattle, green burial. And oh, I just saw the chat about green burial and aquamation. I know there's so many, I've been <laughs> researching all kinds of things lately because it is everything is turning a little more environmentally friendly. We've got the issues with cremation, of course, this with burial. So the composting, aquamation, all these things are becoming available. Um, and I'm always surprised by what people choose. It's really interesting. I, I, I tend to see younger people going towards cremation or excuse me, composting, but 
Um, a lot of people are kind of getting into that now too. And you can prepay for all of this. You can finance it. You can do everything. And I will tell you, it's really nice to have a will and a beautiful estate plan for your kids. But what kids appreciate the most immediately after someone has died is when you prepay for their memorial expenses. Cremation, burial, you can do all that. And kids just say, that was the best thing that my parents could have done. And so I always like to pass that along because it was, it, it is really helpful. But here are these little, these are little pods where bodies go and they're, um, and in your body can fully compost within 30 days, including your bones. So we won't leave you with that though. That's not our last slide for the day. So what a, a question I always get from people, you know, if I'm just out and about talking about estate planning with people, they say, well, okay, so when do I need to actually get an estate plan done? Um, and we talked about a lot of these as I've babbled on today, but the, the idea is if you have real estate, you want to get something in place. That's a big asset. It's complicated to transfer and it's important to document what your intentions are. If you have minor children, you guys, guardians, so important. Um, also, we haven't gotten into this in as much detail, but really important with the distribution of your estate is the idea that you can put, you can create trusts in your will or in your living trust. And these trusts are, they're triggered or they're created at your death if certain things are true, okay? So we call them conditional trusts or um, contingent trusts. For example, I have a trust for my kids in my will that says, if my kids are under the age of 30, they will get their money in a trust. The money can be used for their benefit by a designated trustee that I trust and I want to have involved in their lives. And when they turn 30, they get the rest of it outright. Kids are, I mean, you should see what I, see how well shoot I'm, I'm sure a lot of you've seen how kids spend money but you know money they get a car the, the first thing is they get a car um the next thing is they get a bunch of other stuff that at target it's just like it's just wild how money is spent so you can regulate how your kids spend money people have it in for a lifetime too so it, you can do it as long as you want bye molly um so we've got the minor children issue um if if a beneficiary in your family that you want to give money to does have substance abuse issues currently or in the past, we can create special trust for that individual to make sure that they don't use it in a way that will hurt them. If you believe that is necessary, those are always very interesting trusts and very important in my mind. Also important for disabled beneficiaries, if you have a, a beneficiary who is receiving benefits from the state, specifically SSI, not SSDI, but SSI and Medicaid, they will lose those benefits or they will be complicated if they get an inheritance. So we wanna pop those, the inheritance into a special needs trust, which is a specific type of trust and they can get both their benefits and the benefit of the inheritance. So it's important to be very mindful with the disabled beneficiaries. I touched on out-of-state real property, major administrative issues there in my mind. Um, not to say you have to get a living trust, but you should talk about it, how that affects your estate. I have so many clients with undeveloped lots in different states. So let's just make sure we get those all tied up. Unmarried couples talked about that, how important it is to be intentional. Um, if you're not going to get married, it's a trend that I'm seeing and I appreciate it, but make sure you have all the legal stuff tied up so that it's not an issue. And I joke, if you're over 18, you might as well get powers of attorney and the basic stuff done. Katie, I'm looking at my watch. I want to be mindful. I do have a few little slides, but it's mostly just resource stuff. Do we want to um, take some questions or should I just do these last few? What do you think? Yeah, please feel free to ask any questions that you have at this time. Okay. So much info. So I can give a quick rundown if you want, if I have two minutes, I can wrap yes. it up here. Okay. So Great. a question, really good question to ask is what does this cost? No matter where you go to get your estate planning done, it should be a question you ask. A lot of lawyers do it hourly here at my law firm. We do it um, usually on a flat fee basis. Uh, <laughs> Alexander, uh, any tips on how to get parents on board with estate planning when they're resistant? Um you know what I want to say is is make the appointment um, if you can, and usually we can. And if you want to meet 
somewhere else, you shoot, you can show them this video once you get it in your email and say, hey, read this. Or um, I do actually, there's a reference here. Orbit Wills is a website that I created to get really simple estate plans done for Washington residents. Um, and it's, it's an online process completely. And you fill out an application. It's 500 bucks for a single person to get it, 750 for a couple to get basic wills done. You can go online to orbitwills.com and see if you qualify to use it because um, certain things have to be true. And then it's just all online. You print the documents within three days, you get them signed and they're done. So that's a nice, easy way to do it and a cheaper way. Um, but if you can get your, your parents into a meeting with someone in my office, um, we try to make it the least intimidating process ever and just talk. We're just talking. If they don't want to go through with it, that's fine. That's not, they're not you know, obligated to pay anything. That's not how we do it. We do flat fees, as I was saying, with at the Narrows Law Group, we do flat fees. And that just seems to be kind of a more palatable way to do it. So they might be surprised at how much more fun it can be than they thought. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll have to talk to you anytime about this. Ben, you ask, are there any, are any of these trusts better at preventing being bled by assisted living expenses? Okay. Another great question, Ben. Um, this is where we get into uh, benefits planning. And if that's something for you or whoever we're planning for. Um, to, so disclosure, I do not do eligibility for Medicaid, but there are types of trusts, irrevocable trusts that you can utilize to shelter assets to also qualify for aid. So it's important if that's something you're looking at that we, that you talk to an estate planning attorney or a Medicaid professional. Um, and I have, I have referrals for that too, if you'd like someone to talk to about that. But a living trust won't do that, just to be clear. Let's see. Okay. We wanna thank Annie for her time. This was an amazing, presentation, lots of very uh, valuable information uh, shared, um, and all the registrants will receive a copy of the PowerPoint presentation along with a copy of the video um, that we will be putting up in our YouTube library. So please look, um, look forward to that. And uh, our next one will be in August with our very own Amanda Burroughs on Financial Planning 101. So we look forward to that as well. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you again, Annie. It was awesome. Hey, thanks guys. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.